thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, this, of course, is not something uh, which occurred so often that the chairman of a Green Party uh, introduces a, well, conservative, or at least someone who comes from the conservative camp. Uh, well, but you said quite rightly uh, that uh, it is necessary uh, to have close connections and even a reconciliation. That's, that has always been my view between business views and ecological, uh, even idealistic uh, perceptions and uh, opinions. And that was something which coined my political life. Uh, before I came to King's College, as you have rightly pointed out, I have been 16 years in the Bundestag and deputy minister in the first Merkel government. And uh, we always tried, especially uh, in the 90s, uh, to have, to bring the Greens out of the isolation in that they were. In the, in the first years in the German parliament, uh, nobody wanted to talk to them. And uh, we thought it was an important uh, tendency within our society. So we reached out, younger people as we were in parliament, because we said climate change is something that affects all of us. And, uh, well, you can also make a lot of money uh, with green technologies, with energy efficiency, uh, with uh, uh, windmills and uh, solar uh, collectors. So it is also a business case. And this policy, in my point of view, more or less characterizes Germany's politics uh, in this uh, century, in the last decade, uh, right or left. They all went for a, a political attitude which... Uh, which tries to, to bring both uh, parts closely together. But that's not the topic. I just wanted to, to respond and say how, how I really believe it is important that uh, ecological uh, uh, opinions and economic opinions have to be reconciled. And I'm sure you do that in Ireland in, a, in, the, in, the, in the best possible way. The subject today is global megatrends. And I would like to start with, with one uh, global megatrend which I think is, is uh, striking. Uh, and that is what I would call the uh, diminished salience of global climate change policy. There is a change of paradigm. Uh, while a few years ago climate change was the number one issue when people discussed energy, uh, today, uh, climate change has a backseat, in, uh, definitely in global politics, but even in countries who are convict, uh, who are uh, uh, w with all their heart uh, supporters of green energies and, and believe in climate change, uh, the issue has been downgraded. Why is that? It is because of the global financial and economic crisis. Uh, people have other problems right now than climate. They have the problem of jobs. Uh, the enterprises have the problem of lower energy of, of, of low energy prices. Uh, everybody looks for uh, energy costs which are affordable f to a family. So it's uh, sustainability not only in in ecological terms uh, that is needed, but also uh, it has to be sustainable vis-a-vis -vis your economic system, your wealth, uh, and, uh, and that is why I think we have a more balanced approach today. I wouldn't go so far and say that climate policy will, will uh, leave the agenda. No, uh, we will be uh, by, we will be reminded because of storms and floods that uh, climate change is going on and there is a catastrophe somewhere out uh, for mankind. So we have to deal with it. But other problems, energy security, competitiveness, 
have come to the forefront. And you can see it very closely when you look to the American election campaign today. Uh, climate change is not an issue. Nobody talks about it. It is, uh, if you talk climate, then you're, you're a loser. Uh, look, four years ago, uh, Obama became a winner with climate change and uh, with uh, climate policy. So in his last, in, in, uh, last State of the Union uh, speech, he mentioned climate change only once. And that was when he said it's uh, impossible to convince Congress. Uh, for uh, uh, on, on uh, uh, legislation concerning climate change. And uh, an analysis of, by a, a scholar from Bristol University found out that Obama has talked less about climate change during his first term uh, than both his predecessors, including George W. Bush. So that's, that shows you a bit uh, that something has changed. Second point, Second global trend which I would like to mention is the rising energy demand in the world. According to the International Energy Agency in Paris, uh, we will have uh, a rise of uh, energy demand worldwide of more than 30% in the next two decades. Particularly energy consumption in developing countries will experience a sharp increase about 45% by 2030, compared to an increase of only 2.5% in the developed countries. So uh, while we are pretty stable in the developed countries, there's an enormous rise in developing countries, and that is due to population growth, uh, economic expansion, and of course, urbanization. By 2030, there will be about 8.3 billion people on the planet, uh, while low birth rates and a shrinking working age population in developed countries will result in modest economic growth and energy demand, developing regions like India, China, Africa, for instance, will see steep growth in their populations and working age groups. Well, China, not so much populations because of the one-child policy, but in China, of course, the, the uh, the idea to grow every year by 10% and more means an enormous energy hunger. And we see that uh, every day when we look in, in our newspapers about new Chinese uh, uh, purchases of energy companies, of shares of gas companies, of raw materials uh, throughout the world. <coughs> Strong economic growth and the improved living standards and increased prosperity will require more energy. By 2030, energy consumption in developing countries nearly doubles that of developed countries. Rising urbanization rates will also continue to play a key role in increasing future energy demand. The share of the world's population living in cities has increased from 30% in 1950 to 50% today and ex is expected to rise to nearly 70% by 2050. So uh, an enormous trend to urbanization. Uh, just to illustrate, 30 years ago we had only three cities with over 10 million inhabitants. Mexico, New York, Tokyo. Today there are 20 such cities and only four of them are in developed countries. Uh, Los Angeles, New York, Osaka, Kobe, and Tokyo. The astronomical rise in urban populations will require additional housing, public transportation, infrastructure, water systems, which in turn will consequently drive up the demand for energy. So, enormous rise of energy demand. Uh, third point, a green revolution is underway and it will not be stopped. So whatever I said with with the, uh, uh, with the change of paradigm and change of priorities, the Green Revolution will continue, perhaps at a somewhat slower pace, but it is uh, an enormous factor worldwide, also an enormous economical factor worldwide. During the period from 2005 to 2010, 
total global capacity of renewable energy technologies grew at average rates ranging from 15 to 50 percent annually. The IEA estimates that the share of renewables in global electricity generation, excluding, excluding large hydropower, will increase from about 3 percent today to 15 percent in 2035 with the EU and China making up <coughs> nearly half of this increase. This rise in renewables is made possible by the provision of enormous amounts of subsidies, whose annual sum is expected, is expected to quadruple from around 50 billion euro in 2010 to 200 billion euro in 2035. That's it clear political decision and even if we might see some changes in general the, the subsidies will continue to grow especially because they are contracted in Germany uh, if you have well and in other countries if you have your feed-in tariffs uh, secured uh, two years ago you have them for the next 20 years with an ever-growing uh, amount of money which has to be paid uh, from the taxpayer in 2011, about 120 countries worldwide had some type of policy target or renewable support policy at the national level, up from 55 countries in 2005. So the global awareness that you need renewables, that you have to invest uh, in them, even with government subsidies, has grown not only in Europe but also in Africa, Latin America, and so on. And yet, despite this expansion in global renewable energy capacity, we are still far away from the age of renewables in the next two decades. And this brings me to the next global trend. Uh, coal, oil, natural gas, the, fossils, fo uh, the, the fossil fuels will remain. And they will remain to play the most important role in energy demand in the next 20 years at least, pro most probably even longer. In 2030, coal, oil and natural gas will still account for nearly 80% of the world's primary energy mix. And what is interesting is that all three are pretty much account uh, pretty much for the same amount. They will be about 27% uh, uh, each while major non-fossil fuel groups will have market shares of around 7% each. So 26% coal, perhaps 27, perhaps 28, so something about this, the same amount oil, the same amount gas, and when it comes to renewables and other energy sources, 7%, even with nuclear. So <coughs> fossil, we will remain for the next two decades, and that's the foreseeable future, in a fossil world. We can do here as much as possible to overcome them. But in China, in India, in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, in the US, fossil fuels will remain a backbone of uh, fossil uh, materials will remain the backbone of the energy supply. Global oil consumption, excluding biofuels, is set to increase from 87 million barrels a day in 2010 to 99 million barrels a day in 2035. So we had a discussion a few years ago about peak oil. So oil is now decreasing because there are no reservoirs. That's, that's, uh, that's the past. We have new reservoirs, we have new techniques uh, to go deep into the sea. We have. Uh, uh, tight oil in the US, we have uh, oil sands, so new forms, new technological possibilities uh, which have been the way paved by high oil prices. Uh, they made it economical to, to go even deeper, uh, to get uh, the last out of the reservoirs, uh, and that, has, uh, that is responsible for this enormous uh, increase. According to IEA, and that's, that's a, for ecologists even a, a worse news, coal, 
accounted for nearly half of the increase in global energy use over the past decade, and its use will continue to rise through to the early 2020s. At least. That's, I mean, we, we all discuss since many years uh, the, the, the CO2 emissions, the dangers, nevertheless, half of the energy, the, of the rise in energy demand has been satisfied by coal on this planet. Um, which is, in my point of view, uh, it's, it's a fact, first of all. If no measures are taken, then, according to the IEA, coal use is even projected to increase 65% by 2035 under current policy conditions making it the fastest growing fossil fuel. Coal will still continue to be the second largest primary fuel globally, at least until 2035. Especially countries with indigenous coal reserves and a high share of solids in their energy mix are expected to continue to drive the demand. Take the central and eastern countries, for instance, also dubbed the EU11, for instance. Coal comprises about 36% of their energy mix, triple that of the rest of the EU with 12%. So it's, it's very clear if we discuss a common energy policy in Europe, and I understand you had Gunther Oettinger, the EU commissioner here uh, uh, last week, uh, well, the Central and Eastern Europeans are uh, more and more unhappy with the energy roadmap 2050, with the aims. Uh, well, they stick to 202020 but they are absolutely unhappy when you set uh, more ambitious goals, like the Irish goals, like the German goals. They say, well, you can do that, but please, not for us. And they begin to be more and more aggressive, and, well, aggressive is too strong, outspoken and assertive on, on, those, uh, on those issues. So, uh, because for them, it means the... Uh, it's a question of survival of their economies. Uh, they depend on coal much more than we do. Uh, they do not want to have more gas coming from Russia, which increases their uh, dependency. Uh, and uh, they say, well, on the, un on the one hand, you want us to, uh, uh, to close the, the wealth gap between East and West. We should grow. And on the other hand, you put burdens on us that our energy prices rise and then our economies do not grow but leave the country. But not only Central and Eastern Europe, take China, the world's largest coal producer with the third largest reserves in the world, already consumes nearly half of global demand today and will likely maintain its heavy reliance on coal as a relatively cheap alternative to other fuels to power its rapidly, for its rapidly growing economy. Alongside coal, natural gas is projected to be one of the fastest growing fossil fuels. Its share in the global primary energy mix will nearly reach parity with oil and coal by 2030. Meanwhile, and that is the next trend, the next global trend, that is unconventional gas, uh, mainly shale gas. It makes up about half of the world's total estimated natural gas resources largely due to recent advances, ad, advances in technology. The IEA is already talking about entering a golden age of gas, and that basically because of the shale gas revolution that we have seen in the last years in the US, and that will repeat itself in other parts of the world, perhaps not in Europe because of resistance of, of, uh, of people and of somewhat smaller reservoirs, but definitely in China, definitely in India, definitely in, well, I would say most probably in Russia, where it is more economical to exploit the shale gas reservoirs than to build a new uh, big uh, natural gas exploitation in the Arctic. Stockman Field, for instance, is more expensive than starting the own shale gas production. So shale gas will come globally. 
and it has already changed the global landscape. Uh, also for Europe, it has become a game changer already. Why? Uh, well, large parts of Europe, including my country, were to a large extent, were and are to a large extent dependent on pipeline gas coming on the basis of long-term contracts from Russia. This has been uh, started during the Cold War for, for Germany. Uh, Russia was a very uh, good, reliable partner in that energy partnership. We got via pipelines gas from Siberia uh, and uh, it was, uh, the contracts have been served 100%. Um, so everybody you find, you, you talk to in German energy utilities will say, well, the Russians are good business partners. But these long-term contracts uh, have, uh, are on the basis of energy prices, of oil-indexed energy prices, which have nothing to do with today's gas prices on world markets, on spot markets. Because of LNG first, that was the first gas revolution, liquid, liquefied natural gas, which you bring via tankers from Qatar or Algeria to Europe to the US and so on, uh, and, and then by the shale gas revolution in the US. And, and how fast this change of landscape uh, occurred, you can see that uh, with the fact that the US has uh, planned and constructed 20 LNG terminals at their coast to get LNG gas from basically Qatar, uh, transfer it to natural gas, which you can use in households or for, for, for companies or for transport. Today, they change these uh, terminals because they are on the verge of becoming gas exporters. So a country up to a few years very much dependent on gas export, uh, is today independent from gas uh, imports and is on the verge of exporting gas to much cheaper prices uh, than Russian pipeline gas. So uh, with that, and also even with that perspective, you have enormous pressure to these long-term contracts, which are, uh, by the way, all, which have already been renegotiated uh, uh, only because of the threat of large amounts of cheaper gas coming in, also because of LNG, which has uh, uh, brought the, the spot markets to, to lower prices. Then we have another, uh, another, another new development. We will, uh, from the year 2017 on, have uh, gas from Central Asia. No, not from Central Asia, from the, first from the Caspian arriving in Europe gas either by Nabucco West Pipeline or by the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline coming from the Shah Deniz giant gas field in Azerbaijan to Europe and contributing to uh, a diversification of gas supplies. So we have shale gas, we have LNG, we have perhaps in Poland a f uh, indigenous shale gas uh, production we have a gas coming from uh, Azerbaijan, which means that we in Europe, uh, well, are entering a phase of, an, of, a, of a gas glut with uh, gas prices which tend to go down, a development that nobody foresaw a few years ago. So that is a revolution. And imagine the same is possible when it comes to, almost the same as possible, when it comes to shale oil production. And I give you some figures on that. According to the US Energy Information Administration, the Beckon shale oil formation in North Dakota and Montana, with an estimated 3.6 billion, billion barrels of oil reserves, uh, produced an average of 2,000 barrels a day in the year 2000. Today, the average, 
average production rate stands at around 445,000 barrels a day, nearly the equivalent of the average 2011 oil put of the whole of North and South Sudan. So there is also an oil revolution starting in the US. This has been facilitated by the increased use of horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing, coupled with elevated prices for crude oil and other natural gas liquids. As a result, U.S. domestic oil production has increased by over 1 million barrels per day since 2008, but there is also a notable development on the consumption side. During the latest presentation of the BP World Statistical Review 2012, the chief economist of BP observed that the U.S. has demonstrated a remarkable improvement vis-à-vis -vis other economies due to a reduction in U.S. oil imports, further evidence of the, uh, of the ways in which the technological improvement fostered by open competition in North America are changing the geopolitics of energy. Geopolitics of energy. The BP uh, man talks about this, and I think that's very clear here. What happens if the U.S., as some predict, becomes almost... Oil, perhaps not totally, but almost oil independent by 2025-2030. Um, um, what does that mean to the global engagement of the United States, of their engagement in the Middle East? Some might say, well, great, no more Afghanistan and Iraq wars. That's what we all wished for all the time, that they don't entangle everywhere. But what is the power vacuum they, they might <coughs> leave? Who will jump in? The Chinese, perhaps? Is that a better world then? Pax <coughs> Americana, uh, substituted by uh, Pax Chinois, or I don't mm. know what you, how you would say. So, so it's a, uh, the, the geopolitical meaning of a U.S. becoming more and more energy independent is uh, of enormous importance to all of us. Will they send their boys to defend the Strait of Hormuz, uh, which roughly 20% of the world's daily oil exports flow today? Will they uh, bring their boys to Iraq or other places in the world, intervene? Those who said the US did these interventions only for oil, well, if they are right, then the U.S. will probably move into a decade or into decades of isolationism, which, is, which would not be the first time in history. And at least in my point of view, every time when the U.S. withdrew from world affairs, the situation turned to be worse and not better. But of course, everybody has his own opinion about those things. Nevertheless, however you look to those things, and that's my, my last mega trend, we have, we will see rising energy nationalism and imperialism in the years to come. Because of uh, the rising demand, and this rising demand is stronger than even the best uh, findings of, and, and, uh, of new reservoirs. It goes so fast, so quick, that the uh, competition about the reservoirs will grow, will rise. Uh, well, and today, nationally owned oil companies control almost 90% of the global of the globe's total oil reserves and 70% of the production. Uh, a few years ago, when we talked about the oil majors, we talked about Exxon, BP, uh, Chevron, Shell, and so on. Today, Exxon is number 14, ranks number 14, uh, when it comes to uh, the control of reservoirs uh, in the world. The strong, uh, Players are the Gazproms, the uh, big Saudi, uh, Qatari, Chinese, uh, Iranian uh, conglomerates of uh, who control the reservoirs. 
And that has nothing to do with free enterprise or uh, supply and demand uh, uh, policies. Uh, it has a lot to do with strategic wins and losses and uh, energy will, in my point of view, I fear it. I am not saying that I want it. The, the opposite is true. But my fear is that energy, the power that you win with controlling energy and raw materials, uh, rare earths and so on, water, uh, that is the weapon of the uh, of the 21st century. Uh, that is what makes powers big and powers small, and it will be used as a weapon. So this is the subject of my institute. To Well, we will not prevent it, but to uh, analyze it, to discuss it, to look for schemes, to, to prevent uh, worst-case scenarios. Uh, but uh, we see these nationalist tendencies everywhere. By the way, not only by when it comes to coal and, and, and oil and gas, also when it comes to renewables. Look to the subsidies war between China and Europe. The Chinese highly subsidize their um, uh, solar panels. They come with, with a kampf price, fighting prices uh, on the European market. Uh, and uh, in Germany, one uh, solar company after the other closes down because they are outcompeted by the Chinese. Uh, geopolitics play a role uh, everywhere. There's a geopolitics on pipelines, but geopolitics plays also a role when Russia plants its national flag on the seabed uh, at the North Pole during a submarine expedition. Canada reacts with military maneuvers in the Arctic. The US drills for oil in West Africa. Uh, China does business with Bolivia to get the lithium uh, under control, and so on and so on. So this is where foreign and security affairs and energy uh, come close to each other, and, and that is a topic which which we should look at at Europeans uh, and which uh, we should prepare uh, to, to answer. So those were a, f a few thoughts. Uh, and, uh, well, it's not a golden future. I think there are a lot of problems and challenges. Uh, and uh, in my point of view, and there I absolutely agree with Commissioner Atena, we do much better as Europeans if we do it together and not uh, every country by itself. And we have to learn from each other, from our experiences, but at the end come to uh, good compromises and, and do it together in this uh, competitive world is the only chance for us to survive, in my point of view. Thank you very much for listening.